Chapter 1. I Have Found the Way There is only one way to enter the kingdom of heaven, reality, and that is the way Jesus taught, the surrender of the personality. That means to commit your whole life, body, soul, and spirit to God in the conscious recognition that He alone is responsible for your life, your health, your supply, and that He will do everything for you when every vestige of your personality has been removed. When man ceases to think, he is thought through. When he ceases to act, he is acted upon. When he no longer speaks, God speaks through him. When he no longer feels, he is felt through. Drawing your inspiration from within, you can draw only beneficial conditions into your experience. It is obvious, therefore, that any teaching which panders after man's personal desire telling him that he can have the good things of life remaining as he is is simply not true. It is quite impossible, as millions of truth students will testify, to turn negative into positives, thoughts into things, discord into peace, poverty into prosperity, or sickness into health by a thought process alone. We shall have to learn this lesson sooner or later, and it might as well be now. It will never be possible to find the spirit unless you are willing to let go of the personality. All other efforts and methods are vain. Only by becoming absolutely impersonal can we do the things which Jesus did. It is always possible to alter circumstances and to change the destiny of our lives. But we must start all over from scratch. I am realization of the spiritual self in the waking state, the way. The Word. The Word, creative thought, is the instrument through which the divine current flows. The Word is the ultimate of all things. Creative thought, true thought, is not creative in the sense that it creates something new, but that it reveals what has always been. To speak the Word of Revelation, that it must proceed from clear consciousness or reality, where there is neither thought, condition, feeling, nor form. Clear consciousness is completely empty and silent without form and void. As God It is not until we stop thinking about God and begin to be God that we really unify ourselves with Him. Omnipresence means to discover God within ourselves. Then we shall see Him in everything and everybody. The Father Knows If one's concept of God is true, he will not ask for personal benefits. Divine wisdom knows what we need before we ask. To be truly godlike, therefore, we should never ask for anything unless it be spiritual, such as a whole mind, more understanding, more wisdom, and more of the consciousness of God's presence. When these, our real needs, are realized, temporal necessities will be added unto us. Seek ye first the kingdom of God." and all things will be added unto you. Make an end of praying. Before one can experience infinite peace, he must be absolutely prayerless and desireless. God speaks to us and manifests himself through us when the body and imagination are absolutely still. He cannot act upon us or for us as long as we are full of ourselves or full of our needs. To believe that we have received all things leaves no room for personal needs. It is a recognition of completion. In spirit and in truth. To worship God in spirit and in truth, one must be emptied of himself. The true medium of divine revelation is a quiet mind and a quiet body. As the personal self is forgotten, the divine self takes possession of us and permeates us through and through. When we are absent from the body, personality, God reveals himself to us as a light, life, substance, and power. Not a light, life, substance, and power outside of us, but a light, life, substance, and power which we are. Take no thought. Take no thought for your life means to slow down the action of the mind to that point of divine stillness where God can do our thinking and acting for us. Take no thought and surrender are synonymous terms. To surrender a problem to God means literally 
that we take no more thought about it. God works for us in proportion to our stillness. The Supreme Reality Heaven is an absolute and eternal state of consciousness, which is definitely unrelated to anything on the manifest plane. It is a formless state of consciousness in which there are neither thoughts, ideas, persons, places, nor things. No thing appears in the heavenly state of consciousness, and yet it is the supreme reality. Personality Personality, which admittedly is at the root of all man's troubles and problems on the relative plane, is nothing more nor less than the sum total of all his desires, thoughts, and feelings. By changing the action or response of his soul from the outer world of effects to the inner world of cause, we change the man. As the personal self disappears, the forms or limitations go with him, and man enters again into the imperishable and deathless state of consciousness, which is God. To know the mysteries, Jesus said to those in Christ, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom, but unto them which are without I speak in parables. The ultimate truth is only for those who are ready and willing to give up the personal self, who refuse to give its false judgment any more power in their lives. A disciple is one under discipline and implies readiness to do, to be, and to receive. A disciple is one who wants truth for its own sake and not for purposes of demonstration or personal benefits. In the beginning, God. There is only one consciousness which is spiritual consciousness and which all men share equally. One light shines through all. It manifests as many thoughts and beliefs, but it still remains spiritual consciousness. The intellect, which Jesus referred to as the glass darkly, does not change the nature of spiritual consciousness any more than the stained glass window in a cathedral changes the white light of the sun streaming through it. It only changes its appearance. The light, consciousness, is always the same. The human mind is only divine mind in appearance. Thus, any darkness in our lives is only the darkness of our human belief. If you make your bed in hell, or the extreme state of separation, I am there. The spiritual light shines even in our darkest experiences. Reality The only substance any thought has is the consciousness or awareness which we give it. Withdraw the consciousness and the thought disappears. To experience a thing, we must first think of it. It must first be an idea in the mind. The idea, on the other hand, is powerless to affect us without our consciousness or substance to give it motion, power, and life. Thoughts come and go, but consciousness remains the same. There is no reality in a purely relative concept of the divine being. Reality is not what we think or imagine God to be, but that which is eternally true and abiding. Before one can prove spiritual law, he must first have an absolute and unchanging idea of God. We conclude, therefore, that reality is that state or condition of consciousness which remains the same when all thoughts, ideas, images, and desires have been banished from the mind. When personal consciousness disappears as form, we are present with the Lord. We establish this condition of consciousness through meditation and silence. Relief The relief which all men seek from separated states of suffering will come to them as a strong inner sense of peace. Metaphysically interpreted, Relief and peace mean the same thing. Peace is the answer to all states of suffering. It comes to us while living in the world, but not being of it. Jesus did not say that we were to withdraw ourselves from the world, but to give it no power over us. To experience reality, we must be detached from above the world. Seek ye the Lord. The question, Why are we here? can only be answered by Jesus' words, to seek and to save that which we lost. We are here to recover our lost awareness of God. Not that we have lost Him in the sense that He has left us, but that we have lost track of conscious contact with Him. To be aware only of body and intellect without the spirit that animates them is to only be half alive, is to be in a state of separation and death. Importances 
The most important things in life are inward attitude and reactions toward outward events. These alone determine the measure of our spiritual growth or awareness of truth. As long as we are dominated by, or in bondage to, anything on the relative plane, we are not ready to enter the kingdom of heaven. To overcome the world, we must change our perspective of it. We must see it from within. Spiritual rewards proceed from a consciousness of wholeness, reality, and not from separated states of illusion. It was of those who were absent from the body that Jesus said, Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Appearances Until one finds the reality which underlies appearances, he cannot be free. The consciousness of spirit is of one kind, pure and eternal. Taking no account of evil, it does not die nor change. We are deceived by life because we do not understand it. We are fearful for the same reason. Thus, to be free from fear, free from want and free from misery, we must find that consciousness which is eternal. We do that by the constant subordination and sublimation of things and conditions to ourselves. True happiness and freedom are not in having relative things, but in outgrowing the sense of our dependence upon them. The millionaire enfeebled by things is just as void of happiness as the beggar who has nothing. Power There is only one power in the universe, which is God. All other powers are tributary to the One. Jesus recognizes when He said, The Son can do nothing of Himself. When He can humble ourselves sufficiently to acknowledge the impotence and spiritual ignorance of our own personalities, then we are making of ourselves instruments for the power. We are intelligently cooperating with it. The mentalist tries to use the power. The Christ-conscious man lets the power use him. When we are conscious that we have no power of our own, then our power becomes great within us. Ye shall know the truth. To know the truth is to be absolutely certain about everything in our world. Truth consciousness is unalterable. It is of one kind, entertaining no doubts, compromises, nor contradictions in the mind. Ye shall know the truth, when ye seek truth for its own sake, and not for what it will do for you. To be truthful is to have aligned ourselves with the purpose of our own being. Good and Evil There is no good as opposed to evil. There is no heaven as opposed to hell. All the pairs of opposites are wholly relative. One who knows his real identity is above the pairs of opposites and not subject to them. To return to the perfect state of wholeness is to turn within, to the truth of one's own being, to that which is neither good nor evil, but a fuller illumination of that unalterable and virgin state of consciousness which knows nothing outside of nor apart from itself. The ultimate consciousness is neither good nor bad. It is consciousness, reality. God-likeness and God-lessness, therefore, are only relative terms which designate varying states of awareness. The pure of heart. Jesus tells us that the necessary condition for seeing God is purity of heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Correctly understand the word pure does not have any reference to morality as we are used to think of it. It means that before we can enter into union with God, we must be purified of the personality with all its thinking, desiring, wishing, and willing. It means self-forgetfulness and detachment. To be pure in heart, we must become empty, empty of everything personal. If we cannot become empty, we cannot see God. My peace I give unto you. Infinite peace is the gift of God. It is the great solvent of human woes. It is a solution to every problem and the fulfillment of every right desire. The peace of God is a divine state of repose which cannot be lost. It is an unbroken sense of completion which is not dependent upon money, health, conditions, or circumstances, an eternal state of spiritual quietude with nothing in the world can disturb. To be at peace, in the spiritual sense of the word, is to be absolutely motionless within, free from desire, free from struggle, to be at ease, to be satisfied, to be perfectly contented. 
true peace within the soul leaves nothing to be desired. It is our power to rule and dominate all things in the outer world. Thus, to possess God in great tranquility is to be free from those material attachments which make men spiritually small, crippled, and infirm. This is eternal life. The life we have is the only life there is. It was never born, nor can it die. Being one, it is eternal now. When, therefore, man ceases to identify himself with the body, ceases to take thought about it, he enters into life eternal. To be absent from the body is to be free from fear, free from disease, and free from death. Meditation Meditation is the art of being still. Its primary aim, as someone has said, is the detachment of this entity or person who is acting, working, walking, moving, from the activities themselves, so that he might get a chance to be truly conscious to know himself. It is a mental process of coming to ourselves. Until we find that which is behind the intellect and personality, we shall be only half alive. God is never away from us, but only seems to be because we have crowded him out, because we do not take the time to give him time for us. We can appreciate the tremendous value of meditation only when we realize that heaven can be entered after death, only if we have already entered it while alive. This is the value of life in the flesh. There is no other worthwhile value. Action and Inaction Until one finds a divine balance between action and inaction, between doing and not doing, between thinking and not thinking, he will miss the greatest good that life has to offer him. In between the two is that harmonious existence which Jesus defined as the Father within, the white line of truth where man looks not for results, but is content with whatever God sends him. On one side of this line is the human will, while on the other side is God's will, and in the middle is the living realization of the two in perfect alignment. This is the meaning of the statement that the government shall be upon his shoulder. It is committing our way unto the Lord, and he shall bring it to pass. It is a secret of involuntary living, of having everything at the right time and in the right way, everything in perfect sequence and perfect order. It is the perfect balance between God and man. When we find this balance through spiritual unity, God enters into us, and we enter into God so completely that His life becomes our life. His breath, our breath, His mind, our mind, and His substance, our substance. It was because Jesus could mentally stand on this point throughout His life that He became the Christ. His personality was perfectly integrated with God. God's consciousness became His consciousness, and His consciousness became God's consciousness. Thus the line is the meeting place between God and man. Give us this day. There is every indication in the Lord's Prayer that Jesus intended to be said in the morning. He who integrates himself with God early in the morning will carry the influence of the divine presence over into the activities of the whole day. He will carry it over as a sort of heavenly afterglow of his meditation, so that God will be a steady influence in all his thinking, decisions, and activities. In the morning the mind is free, unresistant, unburned, and fresh. It is easier to pray at that time, because the mind is closer to God when one awakens than at any other time of the day. Thus, to tune in with God early in the morning, immediately after one leaves the subjective state of sleep, even before one dresses or begins to think about the day, is to give God the power in the day. Meditate in the morning, and my presence shall go with thee throughout the day. I, God, change not. The changing factor in man is the personal action of the human mind. Thoughts, images, ideas, and feelings come and go much as the pictures which one sees on the cinema screen in the theater. The screen is never affected or changed by the picture. Even though thousands of pictures can be flashed upon it, it remains the same, fixed and unchanged. Now let the picture represent the action of the human mind, and let the screen represent the consciousness, and you see at once that man is not the sense impressions of the human self, but the screen which is the divine self or ultimate consciousness. When man takes no thought or is absent from the body as in meditation, 
He is bringing personality to an end that he may become aware of the screen or conscious of consciousness. The screen is the man, heaven consciousness God. Be absent from the body. Being absent from the body of related thinking and present with the Lord, we become conscious of the absolute, unconditioned, and unrelated conscious of God. It is laying down the knowledge of this world which is foolishness in the sight of God, and we might describe it as that condition of consciousness which would be akin to a mind without a body. Since the body has occupied so much of man's thought, Jesus said we must get rid of it before he could discover what he really is, spirit. To lose the possessive sense of his body is the first step every man must take in his journey toward God. The body is merely an instrument which man uses just as he would use an automobile or a telephone. It belongs to him just as his house belongs to him, but it is not the man any more than the house is the man. If it belongs to him, then it is not him. The reality back of the body is mind. The body is spirit at the lower rate of vibration. Thus, when a man is healed, it is spirit in the cells doing the healing according to its own inherent pattern. When man is absent from the body, therefore, he is knowing the truth. He is knowing the divine state of health with nothing can destroy. God speaks. When personality has been brought to a point of nothingness, and the mind is one-pointed and the body motionless, then God is in control. That which we reality speaks of to us in a bodiless and formless state of mind. When the mind can be kept without thoughts, utterly quiet, then one will obtain favorable answers to his questions. Our chief concern, therefore, should be not with results, but with personal inactivity. Let not the fruit of action be thy motive. If God pervades the whole universe, why not let personality retire while he performs the action for us? You do not need to fight or act, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. The only escape from our thoughts is to change the condition of consciousness from which they spring. We do that by periodic retirement from ourselves, from everything which is not God, through communal silence and the temporary loss of personal self-awareness. In these moments of self-abstraction, God comes to us and speaks to us. Leave all and follow me. What are you to leave? Everything on that relative plane, before you can enter into that ultimate, pure, and formless state of consciousness which is God, you must leave everything which is not pure spirit. You shall achieve infinite peace by daily embodying that beautiful calmness which will render you able to accept with undisturbed equilibrium whatever life brings. Truth is the most subtle thing in the whole world. Few find it because only a freed consciousness can know it. Only a clear consciousness can be one with it. Those who seek partial truth cannot find the one truth. Those who seek finite things cannot obtain infinite results. To leave all means to seek truth for its own sake, and this is the very highest spiritual goal we can have. The truth is its own reward because all things are added to it. As we seek truth for its own sake, we are automatically following the Christ. As a man thinketh, as a man persistently thinks about what he is instead of what he appears to be, he will come at last to that which is unlimited by forms, by shape, by names, by objects. The real kingdom of heaven, which is real permanence, safety, and security, says Paul Bruton in his book, Discover Yourself, is the unmanifested reality. It is not made with hands. Formless, it is eternal in the heavens. You can only know it by actual experience. When the experience comes, you will dismiss all ideas. You will not be this or that. You will just be. You will be able to say it is, but not to qualify it by saying it is good, for that denotes its opposite bad and brings it back into your mind into the realm of the relative. That which no man taketh from you, and which nothing can harm, is your absolute recognition of yourself as spirit. If you sincerely change and seek the highest reality, it will take care of you, whether you are a saint or a sinner, wise or ignorant. In quietness and in confidence. We need quietness. We need it most in the midst of our greatest activity and most pressing demands. 
To practice calmness in our most trying circumstance is to give God the power in our problems, is to magnify and multiply spiritual virtues. When we are calm, we are sensitive to the impulses of spirit and opening the way to the more perfect union with God. Indifference The way to quickly solve any problem is to be utterly and completely indifferent to it, to take no thought about it. Indifference to what may be happening on the relative plane is the truth student's greatest weapon. When one is truly indifferent to a condition or problem, he is taking no thought. He is doing nothing about it. He is actually using the problem as an opportunity to consciously dissociate himself from personality or the plane of relationship. Before any one or any problem can hurt or injure us, we must first be personal or subject to it. We must have an idea or thought in our minds through which we can operate. If, therefore, one practices indifference, truth will eventually conquer falsehood. To practice truth, we must be indifferent to that which is untrue. If we do not identify ourselves with the problem, it has no power to bind or hurt us. Thus, the very first thing to do in any unpleasant situation is to be absolutely indifferent to it, to do nothing about it. Let us not forget that before the mind can know the truth, it must be held steady and kept free to find the truth. Only the free mind can find the truth, and the free mind is the one which is unattached to anything on the relative plane. Freedom No man is ever truly free unless he is functioning in that absolute and ultimate consciousness which is unrelated and unbound. When we have learned how to disassociate ourselves from personality, to take an impersonal view of ourselves, and nothing shall by any means hurt us, we shall be too detached from personality to register worry, pain, grief, bitterness, antagonism, prejudice, fear, envy, criticism, or even praise. We shall welcome everything on the relative plane with detachment and peace, being disturbed or affected by nothing. To be absent from the body means to divest ourselves of all material attachments, illusions, and false ideas, thus fulfilling the conditions of clear perception. Since it is impossible for anyone who is in the body to be present with the Lord, the only thing we can do is to change our reaction to it, to refine our conception of it by inwardly refusing to identify ourselves with it. Only then do we gain dominion over it. Only then do we see it as it is. It is not enough to say, I believe in God. For our belief means nothing until we can act in His consciousness. To know God, you must become like God. And this is a state of consciousness which you cannot ever lose once you attain it. The quest for heaven is twofold. First, to give up the personality burden, and secondly, to fix the mind on God and on nothing else. The conscious recognition of the presence. The conscious recognition of the presence means to know again the real self, or that condition of consciousness which is without shape or form, but out of which all forms are created. Reality means that which is, not that which seems to be. Every state or condition of matter in this world is illusion, because it is not what it seems to be. Ice is not really ice. It may melt off into water. Water is not really water. It disappears into steam vapor. Similarly, every state of mind, that is, every set of ideas, every series of mental pictures, is illusory, because they too come and go. There is something which exists behind mind and behind matter, from which both grow and to which they are returned and which they are rooted. That we call spirit or the presence of God. Renewing of the Mind If we wish to avoid the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, the disappointments and unpleasant experiences of life, we must learn to change our mental reactions to them. Experiences will always be like the consciousness in which we think. World consciousness and world experiences, for instance, go hand in hand. We can change the experience only as we change the consciousness from which it springs. To find that perfect mental balance between thought and no thought, and to live there, is to change the human destiny for a divine destiny. It is to wipe out all the unpleasantness in our lives, and subsequently to have actually skip the experienced plane, the plane of problems and vexations, of actions and reactions between opposites. 
He will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon thee. To stay the mind upon God is to be above and undisturbed by relative experience. If ye be in Christ Jesus, perfect unity with God, ye are above the law, of change and reaction to opposites and no longer subject to it. When we seek the reality which lies beyond the phenomenal world, then we shall find peace and not before. The Twin Destroyers The Twin Destroyers of man's income, health, and peace of mind— and the two states of consciousness would do more to keep him out of the kingdom of heaven than any other are fear and need. Out of fear comes need, and out of need springs almost every form of human limitation. Both are destructive in that they can create an ever-widening sense of separation from the source of being. The antidote for these arch-enemies is stated in Jesus' words, When ye pray, believe that ye have received. The only reason anyone ever feels a sense of need is because he is recognizing the absence of God, and since God cannot find us in our belief in his absence, we express that belief in terms of want. Obviously, then, the first thing to do when one is experiencing a sense of lack is to fill the mind with the conscience of God's presence, to recognize that everything is all around us, waiting for us, and that it will become evident to us when we lift our minds above our needs. Lifting the mental level, the promise is that when they turn unto me, I will turn unto them. Jesus said, The Father is more willing to give than ye are to receive. It is obvious, therefore, that the fault or failure is not with God, but with ourselves. So why do we fail to receive from the universal store? Because we fail to lift our minds above our needs and because our consciousness of limitation is greater than our consciousness of God's presence. According to spiritual law, it is impossible for divine substance to reach us as long as our minds are filled with human wants. The one-way law says that, as a man thinketh in his heart, feels in his soul, so is he. We must not forget, therefore, that it is these things which we feel in the heart that God gives us, and not what we ask for with our lips. All true praying is done in the feeling center of our soul, according to your faith or feeling, be it unto you. No matter what we may say or think to the contrary, those things which prevail in our experience are the things which have given our attention or feeling too. We can lift the mental level by getting a clear realization that God is already here, and that the visible evidence of His presence will be forthcoming just as soon as we lose our sense of need. It is never the need which opposes us, but our reaction to it. By taking the attention away from the need and lifting the vision to discern the truth, divine substance flows into us from all sides. Lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. Truth Seekers The truth seekers seldom find the truth, which they seek because they seek it in the realm of conception or the wisdom of man. When Jesus said, Seek and ye shall find, he meant that we were to seek to let God find himself in us, to let him possess our minds. As God finds us, through our renunciation of personality, we find God. If God, as the poet has said, is closer to us than breathing, nearer than hands and feet, then there is no need to search for him but to know him. That which we consider to be outside of us will always be remote from daily living. God is seeking us. He is seeking to form in us a consciousness of Himself. God is life, and life is constantly giving itself to that which lives. God is love, and love is constantly pouring itself out to that which it loves. In love is love reflected. Jesus did not tell us to seek the truth as if it were something hidden and hard to find, but to know it and to be it. He declared that it was our understanding and use of truth which is already within us that makes us free. When our minds are stayed upon the principle of truth, I and the Father are one, then God will find us and we shall find Him. All things shall be given into our hands. All have sinned. All have sinned, said St. Paul, and come short of the glory of God. Sin is not the committal of any overt personal act. 
It is not anything we do, but what we fail to do. It has nothing whatever to do with the violation of any of the human standards of conduct or morality. The dictionary defines it as a transgression of the law of God. It is a falling short or deviation from the spiritual norm of perfected living. It is, in fact, anything that separates us from God, anything that causes us to lose a divine balance. The word sin is from the Anglo-Saxon word sin, S-Y-N, meaning poor markmanship or falling short of the glory of God. The divine balance to which all things are added was stated by Jesus in these words, I and the Father are one. Thus to fall short of this conscience of unity with the whole is to live in a state of sin, is to be outside the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said, If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin. Jesus Christ is the truth revealed. He is the eternal manifested and the temporal, the perfect balance between man and God. Without this pattern of unity, man would have been unaware of spiritual life. All things. The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things unto his hand. Who is the Son? The Son is he who is conscious only of God's presence, one life, one substance, and one power. The Son does not need to ask for things, because all things have already been given into his hand. Jesus said, All that the Father hath is mine, and again, as many as receive him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Those who receive him are those who live constantly in his presence, and to them gave him power to manifest that which had already been given. It is well to remember this truth when we pray. The riches of heaven are not given to the Son of Man, personality, but to the Son of God, Christ consciousness. Look unto me, says the Christ, for I have all that the Father hath. Since all forms of sickness and limitations are due to lack of balance or to confusion in the soul, we heal them by restoring that balance. If man could keep the divine balance now, as some day he must, he would continue to live forever in the present body, we get sick and poor because we lose our balance and we die for the same reason. Salvation is simply a restoration of the balance in the soul. It is getting back to divine principle or perfect poise, and we might define it as that state of consciousness in which the individual's mind, soul, and strength are fused into one. Faith. The faith that overcomes, the world is faithfulness. There is much faith among the students of Christ, but very little faithfulness. By that we mean that there are very few who desire for truth is greater than their desire for material benefits. Faithfulness is an aspiration and stern determination which endures beyond all disappointments and failures to find the truth. Hungering and thirsting after righteousness is indomitable faithfulness which knows no defeat even in the most discouraging circumstance. Who steers right on will gain at length, however far, the port. 